I'm glad that you can join us today for Lesson 10 as we are looking for Jesus in the Old Testament. Uh, on the trip that James and I took a few days ago, a few weeks ago, um, I read a book called The Secret of the Universe. It's something he had bought and brought on our trip, and it's a scientific book. If you're really into quantum physics, you would enjoy it greatly. But it did encourage my heart in thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ, who was the agent of creation that we studied in Lesson 1, uh, and the bigness of the universe. You know, I've never had much understanding of the speed of light. How can it go 186 million miles in one second? And yet it does. That would be about 750 times around the whole earth in one second. And that is just a small particle of how far light goes in a year. And how far away are the ends of the universe? Its bigness boggles my mind. Uh, the man who wrote this book thought that the edge of space is 45 billion light years away, not in one direction, but in any direction. It's huge, and our Lord Jesus Christ did that. But it's also small. Even those of us who are older remember studying about atoms in science class, made up of protons in the center with maybe neutrons and electrons spinning around the protons. And I had a hard time uh, visualizing that because how could something hard be made of dots with space between them? That didn't make any sense to me. The tiniest atom is hydro hydrogen. It has one proton and just one little electron spinning around. But I was amazed to read that that electron spins around that tiny proton 400 quadrillion times in a second. What powers that? How does that not burn up moving that fast? And that's just the tiniest atom, the smallness of what our Creator did. And this is the one who speaks to us in today's lesson. When he gave the law to Moses on Mount Sinai, we're especially going to think about the Ten Commandments, this amazing Savior. I'm sorry I titled this, Looking for Jesus in the Old Testament, because in these 10 lessons, I've seen that Jesus is the focus of the Old Testament. And uh, actually, the Old Testament has more direct words of Jesus than the New Testament does. Well, let's think about the law of God and specifically the Ten Commandments. They were special and unique in several ways. Number one, they opened up personal communication between the God of the universe and a whole group of people, the children of Israel. We saw in Genesis how God spoke and even occasionally visually appeared to uh, people in Genesis maybe a few times in their life, giving them a message, maybe years between those messages. Uh, but now God is speaking to a whole nation of people. And Psalm 147, 19 and 20, tell us that God showed his word unto Jacob and his statutes and his judgments, his law to Israel. And then it says, he has not dealt so with any nation except the nation of Israel. Well, these people have recently come out of slavery in Egypt. They have seen a collection of miracles in the plagues where God showed his power above all the gods of Egypt. 
they have been saved from death the night that the judgment angel went across Egypt. They were saved by sheltering under the blood of a lamb on their doorpost. They were redeemed. They were taken out of bondage and set free by God's grace. They were protected by the pillar of fire and cloud that kept them safe from the pursuing Egyptian army, kept them safe uh, through the Red Sea. And this uh, pillar, this being that spoke through the pillar, uh, made provision for them, uh, food and water. This is a huge, uh, a huge group of people, probably at least two million in a sterile desert, and yet their God provided for them. So the fact that he is speaking to this huge group is unique. But I didn't realize until studying this just how specifically the Ten Commandments relate to the covenant that God made with the nation of Israel. They were about to be given by the speaker. They were about to be not only given verbally, but written in stone by the God who gave them. And if you look at Exodus 19, uh, verses 3 through 5 or 6, Moses went up unto God in, on Mount Sinai, and God talked to Moses, saying, Say this to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did unto the Egyptian, and how I bear you on eagle's wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These laws would enable the children of Israel to be holy. And these are the words that you shall speak to them. And in verses 7 and 8 of chapter 19, it says, Moses called for the elders of Israel, told them all these words, and all the people, the elders and all the people, answered together and said, we will do what God has said. They were saying they would obey the Ten Commandments. Now, the terms of the special covenant that God made with the nation of Israel were the Ten Commandments. And in Deuteronomy chapter 4, 12 and 13, where Moses restates years later what had happened at this time, uh, we read, The Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire that was on top of the mountain, and he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, even ten commandments, and he wrote them on two tables of stone. Now the people were so awed by the presence of God, the fire, the smoke, uh, the lightning, the thunder, the thick cloud, the earthquake, <laughs> the loud trumpet. They said to Moses, you go talk to God for us. We are afraid to talk to this holy being. So God certainly got their attention with this uh, event. And then another thing about the Ten Commandments, God is forming Israel into a nation that have laws that reflect God's own holy character. By the Ten Commandments, God is telling them what he is like. He is telling the children of Israel the way people are to live in his kingdom. He is telling them what is right and conversely what is not right, what is wrong. God's commandments are, we would say, uh, black and white. They're right or they're wrong. No gray areas. Now, all of the people in the world live by a standard of ethics. It is either God's standard or maybe in the 
case of many church members, it's God's standard kind of meshed with their own standard and interpretation or uh, willful ignorance of some of the commands. Or people who live apart from God, if they have no, no word from God what is right, they come up with their own standard of ethics, which is kind of the way we see America going right now. I remember many years ago, a missionary from an, uh, Indonesia, from an island that um, was only populated by na native peoples who had had no contact with Westerners, and yet they knew a lot of Western sins, uh, but they had not had any missionary to give them the words of, the words of God. They had a standard of ethics, but it was completely backwards from what God had said. They believed the way to heal a wound was to rub dirt in it. They valued stealing. In fact, the missionary told many funny stories about how they, people would distract one of them and somebody else would come in the back of their house and steal, steal their eating utensils, which they didn't use and they had uh, no imagination what they could be, but they might hang them on a pierced ear <laughs> or something. Uh, and when the missionary was teaching them the New Testament and told them the story of Judas' betrayal of Jesus, they clapped and cheered for Judas. He had done the things they valued. He tricked someone. He got some money for that. He got rid of someone he did not like. So their ethical standards were completely opposite what the Word of God tells us. Now, on the other hand, Jesus, when he was made flesh and lived on earth, he kept the Ten Commandments. Uh, in John 15, 10, he told his disciples, I have kept my Father's commandments. And none of them said, oh, I remember a time when you didn't. <laughs> they knew he was telling them the truth. Now, the Bible tells us in Hebrews 1, verses 2 and 3, that Jesus was the bright brightness of God's glory. He revealed the image of God in his godliness and in his following the Ten Commandments. In fact, in his teaching, I know you remember many times when he uh, expanded on the Ten Commandments. Uh, it has been said that the law says, Thou shalt not kill, but I say unto you, Don't hate in your heart. You can do the act and violate the commandment, or you can have a thought that violates the commandments. Same thing about lust. He said it's not just the act of adultery that breaks the commandment. It's the thoughts of adultery in our minds. In fact, Jesus so demonstrated all the laws of God that everyone who saw him knew that he was a godly person. Even Pilate, when he was, Jesus was before him, uh, right before the cross, the Bible says Pilate knew that he, he had been delivered for envy, that he had not done wrong. And when he was crucified between two thieves who had broken God's law, one of them realized his own sin and Jesus' lack of sin. And that thief said, Jesus has done nothing amiss. We deserve this. Now, that tells us one thing about the law of God. Uh, it shows us what sin is. 1 John 3, 4 says, Sin is the transgression of the law. Sin is disobeying the law. And then Romans three twenty three says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And from these passages taken together, I believe it's biblical to draw the conclusion that the Ten Commandments, the moral law of God, is for every person that ever lived, in every culture that there ever was, and at all times in the history of the world. 
um, because the Bible says we all have sinned. And the only way we can sin is by transgressing the moral law of God. Well, and Jesus said that even people who do not know the scriptures, excuse me, Jesus taught, uh, did not teach this. Paul taught this. Jesus believed this, but I don't know that it's ever said as clearly as Paul did in Romans 2, 14 and 15. He said the Gentiles, even people that don't know the Bible, have a law written in their heart, in their conscience. Now, the native people that I told you about the missionary was uh, ministering to, they had a conscience that was hard and calloused and didn't feel anything when they sinned. Uh, but a person with a tender conscience, aware of the word of God, hears God's voice saying, you have violated my law when we break these laws. Now, the law of God doesn't just have a moral aspect. It had a ceremonial part about the tabernacle and the priest and the sacrifices. It had a civil part about the nation of Israel who was going to be ruled by God, was going to be a theocracy. It had some laws for daily life. Uh, eat this, don't eat this. Uh, some things are clean, some things are unclean, and this is how you get clean after you've touched an unclean thing. It had laws about farming, what kind of seed you could plant. But these laws, these daily life laws, uh, kind of set Israel apart as people who were set apart to a holy God. But one other thing about the moral law throughout the scripture when God gave the law, he set before the people, there will be curses for disobedience, and there will be blessings for obedience. Well, let's look at the Ten Commandments. In Exodus 20, we're not going to describe these in depth, but I just want you to think about what they mean. The first four t teach us how to give God honor that he deserves as our creator, how to worship God. Number one, uh, there's to be no other God before him. Our, the Hebrew indicates before him or beside of him. Israel was to acknowledge God as the only God. Number two, there were to be no idols because every manifestation of an idol uh, is based on a fal false concept. Nobody knows what God looks like. In fact, Moses wrote many times in the first five books of the Bible, God warned the people, you never saw an image. You saw light. You saw fire. But you never saw an image. Uh, Verse 5 of this commandment that says, For the Lord your God is a jealous God. That Hebrew word is sometimes translated zealous. And I think we are zealous if somebody has the wrong impression of us. We want to correct that. And God knows that we need to know what he is like. We need to not have a false concept. And then number three was not to take his name uh, flippantly, uh, uselessly, not to use his name unworthily, not to rush over his name, but to reverence him. And it is Leviticus 19.12 where the scriptures say, do not swear by God's name falsely. And that's kind of, uh, that's where we get the idea of in court, putting our hand on a Bible and swearing to tell the truth uh, because you are swearing by God's name. And then number four talks about remembering the Sabbath. That Hebrew word means to be mindful of it, to guard it, to protect it, to observe it narrowly. That was interesting to me, to mark it every week, a day set apart for God. Uh, he is teaching us in the first three to reverence him, and in number four, that our time belongs to him. And this gives exclusive honor to the God of Israel. 
And actually, that exclusive honor is only what we all owe him. But doesn't that fit the example that Jesus gave us in his teaching? The first commandment is this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And then the second commandment he taught is to love your neighbor as yourself. And the following six commands tell us how to relate to other people. The first one is to honor your parents. When you are born, the first authority you encounter is your parents. And that is why you need to learn to honor your parents. And parents need to teach their children to respect and obey them. Uh, throughout life, there will be authorities over us that we need to obey unless they demand something that violates the scripture. And then number six is not to kill because God made human life and he values human life. The scripture tells us in the book of Revelation that Jesus holds the key of death. God gives life and God determines when life ends. Uh, number seven, no adultery, because throughout uh, the New Testament, the relationship between a believer and Christ is described as a marriage, uh, and it's to be exclusive, uh, one for another. That is a, a covenant, just like the covenant God made in the Ten Commandments. Number eight, don't steal, because the Bible uh, Let's us know that it is our right in God's eyes to own property. Uh, not every culture adopts that. And some people who do adopt the owning of property go way overboard with the owning of property. Uh, but this is a biblical concept. Uh, number nine, don't bear false witness. That means don't tell lies. Don't damage the reputation of another by lies. Uh, number 10, don't covet. I guess God knew that we would have desires, desires for food, but we can over-desire food for too much, desires for sleep when we're tired, but we can have over-desires for that. And you know if you've ever looked at a catalog or done any window shopping or perused a store, uh, how the eyes can show us things that we feel like we need. Um, in fact, if we realize it, if we only realize it, all of us have broken all of these many times in our life. And so we owe God a debt of sin, debt for our sin. And that was what Christ paid. But I was interested to learn as I studied about something that was already in place and had been in place since the times of Abraham. Uh, it had to do with a group of people called the Hittites, H-I-T-T-I-T-E, the Hittites. They are mentioned in the Old Testament and some individuals mentioned as Hittites in the Old Testament. Uh, these people uh, geographically lived in the area of Tur Turkey and northern uh, Palestine. They were a kingdom of uh, people who had prominence for hundreds of years, actually longer than the Greek Empire with Alexander and longer than the strength of the Roman Empire. Uh, they were present there when Abraham came into that land. And they had a system of uh, governing that was called the Hittite Treaty. And it was where a sovereign person, um, not exactly a king, but a leader, uh, a sovereign person who would have control over a group of dependent people not a military control, but a treaty. And the people under the sovereign would vow uh, loyalty to him. They would not join his enemies if that happened. And if these people needed something, the sovereign would have some responsibility to help 
meet their need and protect them from enemies. Now, they made treaties, and I will just tell you before we start, a Hittite treaty was written in stone, literally. <laughs> this was something that could not be broken. We first meet this in Genesis 23, where we have the whole chapter basically talking about Abraham buying land that had a cave on it to bury his wife, Sarah. And he brought it, bought it from Ephron the Hittite. And he entered into a treaty with this person. And the last verse of Genesis 23 says that field and the cave in it were made, a sh were made sure unto Abraham for a possession of a burying place. Abraham bought it, but it was his and his descendants, and the descendants of Ephron the Hittite could not try to take that away from him. And so even the scripture tells us that Hittite treaties were secure. Now there is another named Hittite in the Old Testament that may be one you're more familiar with, and that was Uriah the Hittite. Uriah was the longtime friend of King David in uh, the book of Samuel, 2 Samuel 11 and 12. He was one of 30 men who swore allegiance to David when Saul was chasing him, trying to kill him when he was a young man before he was king. And they went here and there with David, protecting him from Saul. They swore that allegiance, that non-breakable treaty with David. And Uriah, the Hittite, maintained his end of that treaty to the end of his life. I don't know if Uriah ever knew that David had had um, a sexual relationship with his wife while he was away fighting on David's behalf. David called him back to try to get him home with his wife so it would look like the baby she, David had fathered would be her husband's. Uriah even valued the Hittite treaty more than he valued his wife. He would not leave the palace of David that night. He slept in the doorway. He did not go home. And David arranged to have Uriah killed so he could add Uriah's wife to his group of wives. The sovereign was not faithful. The man who made the treaty was, and he was faithful unto death. That is the uh, strength and the staying power of a Hittite treaty. But they were written, those treaties were written by a formula. And I'd like you to look in your Bibles at Exodus 20, and we're going to just see how what God said in Mos in, to Moses and this treaty, this covenant he was making was something that Israelite people knew about because it had been in their ancestry. Abraham knew about it. They knew about Hittite treaties. In fact, the, the stick to itiveness of these treaties would advance for many years, even though the Hittite empire uh, disappeared over time. The first thing about a Hittite treaty, it would identify the sovereign or the uh, king or whatever you want to call him who was making the treaty. And if you look at Genesis 21, it tells us who's speaking the words of the treaty. It says God spoke these words. And then it would have a, a brief history of that sovereign and the people. And he said, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And the third thing is, there would be duties of these dependent people, stipulations, requirements. And in verse 3 through 17, we have the, ten, the requirements, the Ten Commandments. But the amazing thing to me was that two copies of the covenant would be incised in a stone 
by the sovereign, by the king. Uh, one copy would be given to the people who were pledging allegiance, and one copy would be kept by the king. Uh, now, we know from scripture that when Moses came down from the mountain with the tablets of stone, uh, he saw the people worshiping idols already. He, he was anger, angered, and he threw them down and broke them. But in Deuteronomy 10, uh, first part of that, uh, God told Moses to make two more tablets of stone and bring them up to the mountain again. And God wrote them in stone again. And one of the tablets would be kept by the king, and one of the tablets would be kept by the people. They usually kept it in the temple of their god. Now, Hittites worshipped idols, and so whoever they made an agreement with would also have idols, maybe the same one or different ones. And they would put it, the tablets, in the, in the temple of their gods because that was a stable place. And where did the Israelites put the tables that God had written? They put their copy in the Ark of the Covenant because it was the covenant God was making with them. That's why this is called the Ark of the Covenant because of those stone tables. Now, I was influenced by the movie, The Ten Commandments, and I have for many years drawn the Ten Commandments like this for children. Two tables of stone with the first five on one and the second five on another one. But actually, that is not scriptural at all. Uh, we're not told that that's what was on the two tables, that it took two pieces of stone for the Ten Commandments. If this was a Hittite treaty, a firm treaty, an unbreakable treaty, the whole covenant would be on one stone, and the same would be on another stone. And uh, where did God keep his? You know, the scriptures tell us that what was in the Ark of Covenant was two tables of stone. If this was a Hittite treaty, that's where God's copy was, and that's where the peoples were. And then... The fifth thing is there would be witnesses listed to this agreement. It would always be the king and some representative of the people that he was going to be over. And there would be curses for violations and blessings for loyalty to this. And Hittite treaties could not be broken. Well, did the children of Israel keep the Ten Commandments? Do believers today, are they bound to keep the Ten Commandments? Over many years of ministry, I've heard many church members defend their sin by saying, we don't have to keep the commandments today. Um, Jesus did. Would we do less in the period of grace than people at least were supposed to attempt to do when they were under the law. Now, no one will ever be right with God because they kept the Ten Commandments. And the main purpose of the law, I think, was not only to show what was right in God's eyes, but to show us that we had broken it. We have missed it. Show us our need for the Savior. It seems that Jesus, in his ministry, when he talked to people who were not following him, and especially the hypocrites, the religious leaders of the day, he honed in on the law. When that precious young man in Luke 18 went to ask Jesus how he could be sure he would have eternal life, Jesus didn't say, well, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. He said to him, well, young man, do you know the commandments? And he did. And he said to Jesus, I've done that since I was a kid. And Jesus didn't say, well, you'll get in for sure. <laughs> he, 
he honed in on the very one of the ten that he could not keep, and it was that he loved his money. He did not want to share. And uh, he went away sorrowing because James 2.10 says if we offend in just one point, we're guilty of breaking them all. Uh, we heard an interesting sermon on our vacation in the church where the pastor was talking about, he said that every time in the New Testament when J Jesus talked to the religious leaders, he brought up the law. Now, I thought, well, that's interesting. And I can think of several times when that happened, but I'm going to have to check that out when I read through the Gospels again. So maybe if you're reading there now, you can check that out and help me to know. It's because of the law we are conscience, conscious of sin. And Jesus preached the law first to lost people before he talked about grace. That made me think of Psalm 19 that we sing often in our church, verses 7 through 13. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. That Hebrew word means bringing that soul back to where it needs to be, restoring that soul to where I've departed from God's truth. So I want you to think about this covenant. This is something God is very serious about. This is something the nation of Israel should have been serious about. It's amazing that God let them last as long as he did because they did such a poor job of keeping it. It is never how we attain salvation. Most people will say, I sin sometimes, but mostly, mostly I do right. No, we all sin. We all need a sacrifice. We need the blood to be applied to our sin, to cleanse our hearts. We need to live our life by God's standards, not by some we adopt from our society or our peon brains. We need to obey the God that made all the universe and that tiny, tiny atom.